Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this series, this iteration of our series on seminars around law and ethics and technology around ICT. I'm exceptionally happy to have Bettina Behrendt here. She's going to talk about autonomous vehicles and probably answer the question about what the question actually is. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Bettina is a professor at the um, for Internet and Society at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Technical University of Berlin. And she's also the director of the Weizenbaum Institute for Network Society. And she is still, I mean, that's how we know each other. She's been a professor at Karl Löwen for many, many years, and she's still a guest uh, professor with us at the Department of Computer Science, DTAI group. And she has quite an interdisciplinary profile. So before she um, that dove uh, made her way into computer science. She's been an economist and a cognition scientist, and I think you still see this from the topic that she's interested in. Bettina, I'm really happy to have you here, and you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Tobias, and thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I see some uh, familiar names, and I'm really happy about that. And I see a lot of new people. Uh, so. Um, I think uh, Tobias has already done everything uh, to introduce me. I would just like to add that this is really very much about teaching. Um, and so it's also about teaching um, that uh, happened at KU Leuven. Um, I'll come back to that uh, on the very last slide. And uh, so I also see that as some kind of uh, integral, um, let's say, effort um, that crosses uh, boundaries of universities, that crosses boundaries um, of countries, because uh, the topic matters to all of us. And um, there will even be some autonomous cars in this, uh, in this presentation, although they don't really play the main role. Um, okay, uh, so um, just to set that scene, uh, we all agree that ethics matters for AI, and um, you know that's always one of my favorite demonstrations of uh, the state of things. Um, the NGO Algorithm Watch compiled a database of AI ethics guidelines, and they compiled more than 160 last update uh, last April, and I'm sure the number is growing. So if you ever feel you uh, need to find out uh, yet another version, then search the inventory. And uh, the thing is that we don't all agree how this should be done. Obviously, the 160 guidelines take slightly different emphasis, but um, the there's interesting things if you're into Twitter, especially you can follow um, Flame Wars. And you've probably heard, or many of you have uh, probably heard uh, about this paper, the stochastic parrots uh, involving Timnit Gebru, who used to be at Google in the AI ethics group, and now she's no longer there. And that was a very acrimonious story. So um, this is the way this paper is currently online with uh, the other authors redacted. And uh, it was three other people. And what we see now next week is going to be um, presented at the FACT conference, and we have three people left as authors. So um, that's going to be a very interesting um, presentation there. And uh, this is a very wide ranging paper about language models and what AI does to counter the bias in general and uh, in language models in particular. And uh, the underlying trend there is that um, the AI community and especially big companies are not doing enough and that this is a bad thing. So a very ethical reasoning. And then um, now I'm uh, going to make sure that people from a certain camp will never talk to me again by referring to Michael Lissack's uh, uh, counter argument to that. And you can see the um, uh, the title of that already, um, that it's a very polemic thing against this other article. And he concludes, interestingly, with a sentence, the goals of the Parrot paper seem noble, but its execution is ethically flawed. So everybody's talking about the ethics of AI and the ethics of the ethics of AI. And um, it's uh, very interesting, uh, often very emotional. 
um, and um, very complex discussion. So, of course, I will take a stand in this big, uh, let's say, uh, debate, um, because I can't not take a stance. Um, and so uh, we also, not, not only do we not agree how we should uh, talk about ethics and AI and what we should do, but also what the outcome should be. So um, this is just uh, one visualization of saying, um, all these nice personalizations that we get uh, leave us in our comfort zone, which when you take it too far uh, and it gets you into some filter bubble. So where do we set that line? And we also don't know what the outcomes should be if um, AIs have, and now when I say AIs, I mean a deployed AI system and artificial intelligence. When AIs have uh, power in the physical world, um, and so one um, here's the here's the autonomous cars. So uh, one very uh, simple question is: if an autonomous car were uh, to uh, have an impending collision, crash into some pedestrians, or swerve crash into a barrier so that all the passengers are killed. Instead, what should um, the outcome be that we want in terms of how the AI acts and what is ethical about that? And what is an ethical choice when we uh, design, when we build, when we deploy such systems? Um, so um, this, of course, then raises a lot of questions not only about how we should develop things, but before we develop things, people uh, need to learn how to um, develop things. So uh, for us, this raises the question how to teach ethical thinking about AI. And then um, because we're self-reflective also how to evaluate that what we did uh, makes sense for the students and um, well teaches them something. And so uh, what I, uh, would like to do with this talk is to um, open this discussion with you and um, uh, with um, potentially larger audiences, of course, by way of describing parts of a course that I'm currently teaching. And um, a key method there is a sequence of question tasks and uh, dialogue or debate. And yes, the cars uh, play a role there. So um, the course, um, and that's a course at uh, TU, but <laughs> living on KU Leuven web pages um, for technical reasons, uh, is uh, called Ethics, Data Science, and Network AI. And um, the questions of the course that I've outlined in the plan is, if ethics is about doing good, then what is good? Who defines that? What can we do to make things better? and you do see the square, uh, scare quotes everywhere. How can we talk about all these questions? And last but not least, very importantly, I think what uh, specific concerns, dilemmas or topics are you, and here you are the students interested in. So I'll take you through uh, a part of this sequence of uh, questions and uh, dialogue in this course um, you using mostly the original course materials with some enhancements and modifications, and um, then um, uh, discuss the this this idea and these questions um, using that. Okay, so um, Tobias told me that not everybody knows the trolley problem. And he put a hyperlink into my abstract, which was very nice. Um, and um, so just to be sure, I will repeat that because this is one of the, um, let's say, foundational thought experiments that uh, are being used in ethics teaching. And um, because, as you see, it involves something that looks car-like, it's also a popular topic uh, when we talk about autonomous vehicles. More about that later. Okay, so what's the trolley problem? The trolley problem is um, framed as the following dilemma. Um, you uh, have this 
uh, trolley car, which for some reason uh, is let loose uh, and uh, is about to race into five people tied to the tracks. And you are in the position to pull a lever where you could derail the trolley to run over this one person. So should you pull the lever? Um, and uh, many philosophers emphasize over and over again that this is primarily a thought experiment. And that with this thought experiment, uh, you can illustrate uh, questions about different types of normative ethics, most uh, prominently the consequentialist versus the deontological school. And there's lots of variations there. And let me just say that super briefly, um, if you're uh, judging some what is good by some kind of measure of the outcome, you would say, okay, if the trolley uh, f follows through on its straight path, five people will die here, one person will die, and if we just count everybody the same, then it's better if one person dies than if five people die. Um, and of course, that seems like a pretty terrible thing to do in a sense, and maybe it seems like something you should do, but um, it doesn't look at is that act in itself good or morally or ethically okay. And uh, we can see more about this if we look at variations. So this is the so-called fat man variation. Again, the trolley uh, is about to crash into these five people. If you're on that bridge, uh, you could push this fat uh, person uh, onto the track. The fat person would stop. Um, the trolley, of course, get killed in the process, and the five people would be die would, would die. Numerically, it's the same thing: one person's life against five people's lives. And uh, but there are essential differences here. Like here, you would actively cause this one person um, to uh, die, whereas here it could be argued that you're just reducing the danger. Um, and uh, so again, uh, we could, and uh, you could also say here that you're using this person um, as a means to save the others, and you can really develop all kinds of, uh, let's say, dimensions of ethical reasoning with this help, like causation, um, uh, using someone, uh, allowing a death versus causing it, um, the uh, is the um, uh, the act correct from your perspective as the agent or from the perspective of the fat person or the one person as the patient and so on. Um, so again, that's a very uh, famous long-standing um, uh, thought experiment that has been around for many years. And uh, it's also been uh, used in many uh, descriptive uh, experiments in psychology, for example. Um, so um, because these normative ethics schools are so important for people to understand how to assess the ethical quality of a decision, this is something you teach people anyway in such a course. Um, now, um, here's another trolley problem, and this trolley problem, again, is uh, involving these cars, these autonomous cars. Uh, you will recognize that it's the same type of picture as the one that I showed before. Um, and you'll see here that this represents the exact same situation, in, in some sense, of um, five people dying versus one person dying, and um, the specific trick of this so-called moral machine experiment was to say we're putting this on the internet uh, we're inviting people from all over the world to say what should the autonomous car do in this situation because we're assuming that this is something that happens uh, for AIs that they act in real life and that they face decisions and that these decisions have consequences and sometimes present dilemmas. Um, and so um, then you're asked to give a vote. 
And uh, not only did they look at five people versus one, but also at different types of people um, or different types of beings. Uh, here uh, you see an example of people versus animals. And the people you will see are internally differentiated as well, like a pregnant lady, an old lady. And I can't really see, I think the first the guy in the background, oh yeah, that's the criminal. Um, who uh, has some kind of stolen money there. And then, uh, so what they did was, uh, I mean, put it put it online, uh, gather uh, responses from all over the world. Here you see like a heat map and uh, map um, how much people expressed a preference for different things, uh, including preference for action, which is swerving or inaction, just not doing anything and going straight. Sparing passengers versus uh, pedestrians, males, females, the large, uh, this is this is fat man in a sense, and the fit, uh, lower status, higher status, unlawful and lawful. Interestingly, uh, the unlawful were the uh, jaywalkers, uh, elderly, young, fewer characters, more characters, and pets and humans. And uh, what you see here is um, this aggregate thing that uh, there was a lot of preference um, for um, sparing humans versus sparing pets, um, sparing more characters uh, as opposed to fewer characters, young people as opposed to elderly, and so on. Um, and then um, um so uh the authors say we were very happy that uh, most preferences were the same the world over but we found different clusters so they cluster this into western eastern and southern um and uh find some preferences that align with let's say other representations of uh cultural differences in how how you would value young versus elderly people um, and so on. Um, but their overall conclusion is, um, yes, you know, maybe uh, we shouldn't make policies just on this, but it's really important for policymakers to know what people think because they should uh, align their choices in regulating autonomous cars um, against that. Um, if anybody wants to protest at this uh, point in time or give a, uh, give a comment about this experiment, um, then I would be happy to hear that. And I see already, no, I don't, I see that uh, we have uh, procedural instructions here. Um, any reactions um, by the audience about that kind of uh, experiment as a not really, but somehow guidance or policy? OK, you want to know what I think. That's fine. Um, so the first thing is, um, because this is an experiment where people are being asked, what should the autonomous car do? Um, I, uh, oh yeah, sorry, the spoiler alert first, of course. Um, I, uh, I think this paper's value is that it's a provocation. Um, I'm not alone in that. There's a huge discussion about this paper. Don't forget this, uh, this was published in Nature, uh, which is as good as it gets. Um, but opinions differ. Um, and uh, in any case, this paper is really well suited to something I would, for want of a better word, call an analytical dissection. And uh, that kind of dissection of arguments is really, really important to me. And so I made this a core method and goal of the course. Um, and uh, if you're curious, uh, there is a whole paper, but I wrote that paper before I started uh, using the article in teaching, but it's also um, on a dissection of the argument and a dissection uh, method. Okay, so going back to the course, um, I gave people a homework. 
And this was after the first two homeworks in which they exercised um, deconstruct, uh, recognizing moral dilemmas and deconstructing arguments. So in homework three, I just told them, read that paper and write a short text. What is the paper about? And are the authors presenting an ethical argument? If so, can you say something about its structure and its ethical stance? Um, um, and uh, do you have any comments? So um, I asked them to be short, which is important uh, in this kind of teaching because some people otherwise go on forever. Um, and it's, um, it's actually really hard to be brief. Um, and um, so uh, one person in this course already, Jenny B, already took my bait and um, asked, are there any thoughts on whether we should automate vehicles at all? Since just being forced to pre-decide this as a basis for the automated decision is already ethically questionable. Um, yes. Um, and Jenny, I'll come to that. Thank you very much. And I completely agree with you. Uh, okay. So um, what I'll now do is um, the base slide was as it was, and then I'll give you in these green uh, call outs, why did I do this? Um, and of course, one of the goals was to make students recognize differences between normative and descriptive ethics. But because this, uh, this experiment is of course, in a sense, a descriptive thing. What do people think? what is good instead of what is good. Um, and still, you can't really get away from being normative yourself if you set up such an experiment. And um, that is also the second order normativity is what I really wanted people to understand and uh, look into. So then um, what I... Um, what I uh, usually do did in the lecture is to always take these homeworks, compile them, uh, group them, analyze them, highlight words um, in order to use that as an intro to the next uh, lecture. So um, whenever it's in italics, it's student answers. So they many th said things such as the goal of this experiment is to measure moral preferences when it comes to accidents with self-driving cars. Sure. The authors of the paper applied empirical research methods to collect data on moral preferences and found correlations between these preferences and various social, cultural and economical factors. Absolutely valid description. Um, and then um, uh, I also looked at what they said about is this, does this present an ethical argument? They said things such as the argument does not seem to be an ethical one, i.e. they are not arguing that a machine should behave in a specific way when confronted with moral dilemmas because of some ethical framework. Rather, they explore the ethical standpoint of the world. Okay, um, so many people wrote more or less this, and I found that interest very interesting. Um, and so I thought, oh, how can I uh, take uh, what they wrote and maybe show them that it's not that easy? And I found in some of uh, the other answers, things such as the authors are not conducting their research based on ethical stances directly, but rather take individuals' preferences as their measurement to give a direction in what way policymakers should frame legal frameworks. And now the should is highlighted by me. Um, somebody else wrote the paper's intent to be to highlight existing differences in ethical preferences by country and to urge legislators, that's even stronger than should, to consider these for guidelines in the field of self-driving cars. Their goal seems to be understanding the moral choices of humans in order to reach an agreement on sensible laws for AI. So, uh, oh yeah, we also had that in the first thing um, as a direct imperative for legal frameworks. 
Okay, so people started getting a bit more sensitized when I highlighted these words, like, okay, apparently there's some normativity going on here, but it was still difficult to understand where this is um, going. Um, and um, question now is, can this be a legitimate argument? Is there better guidance? And um, we uh, we have lots of uh, things, reactions here already uh, about Jenny. Um, why stop at automated vehicles? Not should we automate movement? Um, just because we have technology, if we cannot find an ethically sound solution, could we use it? And are there any thoughts about it that if there are no passengers in the trolley, an option of exploding and a kind of suiciding to stop trolleys should be considered? Uh, that is uh, the, um, okay, let me group this um, a little bit. Now I'm doing what I did with the student answers. Um, I think it's great that you immediately react in this way, like, okay, what's going on here? You know, how how is this situation framed? Like, uh, are there just these options or are there other options? in the setting itself, such as Madi says, like, uh, should it self-destruct? Um, or uh, at a, let's say, more larger systemic level, like uh, Jenny, um, uh, Jenny says, uh, should we use automated vehicles at all? And then Stefan goes even larger and says, why stop at automated vehicles? So, um, he, I see some um, immediate reaction from this group is saying, hey, 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 something's wrong with the problem setting here and we don't buy this problem setting and let's discuss this. And I very much agree with that. And interestingly, I found this um, reaction in uh, various other contexts where I tried this deconstruction method and I presented uh, this experiment uh, to, uh, let's say, more senior, I mean, like, like pe probably the most people in the room here are more senior academics, where senior for me counts uh, when you have your first degree. Um, and um, interestingly, for me, this did not happen in my class. Uh, in f instead, people really expressed appreciation oh that's such a big experiment and um it's uh, it's amazing what they find out and how they set this up um and of course it's completely possible that this was because this was at the beginning of the semester and of because of the way i asked them um but um yeah i i wanted to uh, probe them a little bit more and uh so Right, uh, and so um, I'm going to come back to all these proposals from you, uh, from you later on. But uh, first of all, go further in the direction that I chose to put people into. Um, and so um, my first, uh, and so the first uh, question was, do we have better guidance? And um, you could say the Germans uh, like to do things thoroughly or the Germans have a big car envy, or whatever the reason might be. Um, th this was, um, as far as I know, the first such comprehensive report by an ethics commission on automated driving um, commissioned by the German Ministry for Transport and Digital Infrastructure in 2017. Um, interestingly, this report is is uh, cited in the moral machine paper, but honestly, I don't think they understood it. Um, so what does this ethics commission paper say? Um, and uh, we come back uh, to uh, the fat man because it's uh, kind of um, the most obviously visible manifestation of, hey, I'm actually sacrificing someone in order to save others. Um, 
And uh, while many philosophers say this is a thought experiment, it's actually not, not a thought experiment. Again, another German example, uh, please enrich my knowledge if um, other countries have uh, had similar issues in court cases. Um, actually, quite a while ago, there was a judgment by the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany about the trolley problem. Um, and uh, this was in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, when uh, many people were openly discussing, okay, uh, if this ever happens again, uh, there are bad guys uh, flying a plane into a tower, um, the military or whoever else well, let's stick. Let's stick with the military. Should the military um, be allowed to shoot that plane down? Because then they would be sacrificing um, the two hundred or so passengers on that plane in order to save the three thousand um, working in the uh, office towers. Um, and there was an article in the Aviation Security Act that allowed that. Uh, some people uh, brought that to court and said, this doesn't seem to um, adhere to our understanding of uh, human dignity as enshrined in our constitution. Um, and that is just so central and it's um, the, the bedrock of the whole constitution. And of course, in the German system, it's it's very explicit, but we have more or less uh, identical decisions on the European uh, level, um, which is, and it's very, very deontologically shaped in that sense of saying, no, you must not um, sacrifice one person and use them as an instrument to save other lives, even if it looks nice on this uh, consequentialist uh, uh, let's say, counting of lives. And uh, so with that reasoning, uh, the Federal Constitutional Court said, nope, um, this is uh, in contra this contravenes our constitution. This article from the Aviation Security Act has to go. And uh, henceforth, uh, if 9-11 type things ever happen again, it's not going to be okay uh, to shoot down such a plane. Um, so that's in line with our constitution, supposedly in line with the moral uh, intuitions of our society. But is that what people do? And so very interestingly, um, another um, actor in this uh, case, an author, um, thought about um, looking at this in, this in an artistic experimental way. Uh, and he created a theater play in which, again, centered around this uh, fictitious event in which such a plane had been shot down. Um, and we have this court case um, where we decide is the uh, this young military guy who shot down the terrorist plane, uh, is he a hero or is he... Uh, uh, a criminal because he killed people and of course you know is let's get away from hero and criminal but is he uh, is that okay did he do the right thing uh, or does he have to be condemned for his action and then at the end of that theater play uh, I get um, the audience to vote after hearing all the arguments laid out in wonderful uh, legal and ethical uh, fashion and overwhelmingly what happens is that uh, a large majority says you should shoot down the plane to sacrificing the 200 passengers to save the 5,000 or whatever it is in the scenario that we're talking about. So the democratic impulse is go against the constitutional and the constitution's values and um, that's a pretty hard thing to swallow, I think. Um, so um, I'm uh, presenting students uh, with that. Uh, and um, I'm presenting them also with uh, how this ethics commission uh, report digested this. 
And uh, there's a very interesting uh, paragraph on there uh, where they refer to the judgment, um, where they say, okay, this um, is, um, is not uh, allowed because the innocent parties would be degraded to mere instrument. And um, that's you know, direct uh, deontological uh, normative reasoning. But um, in, it's also really the definition of dignity here. Um, what they also say, and that's very interesting, is uh, there is a difference when you um, program decisions, when you program the AI before the fact, because uh, normally with um, Aviation Security Act uh, reasoning and all these other reasons, you talk about a concrete act um, and not some general rules. So then the Ethics Commission um, tries to uh, describe what can you do uh, when you program something uh, up front. And uh, they go in the constellation of damage limitation that is programmable beforehand within the category of personal injury. The case is different. It's okay and justified to program to minimize the number of victims if the programming reduces the risk to every single road user in equal measure. So this also does away with the discrimination that's inherent in that uh, experiment, you know, female, male, and uh, uh, old people, young people, and so on, um, and says, you must not program anything such that such a supposed uh, dilemma would be, um, would be uh, resolved in a way that amounts to an unlawful discrimination in this sense. Um, or that makes any kind of uh, difference um, upfront about different uh, people. Okay, and uh, no matter what, uh, you cannot sacrifice one person in order to save several others. So that guidance essentially tells us the whole setup of the experiment is wrong, right? Um, you, you can't just force people to make this choice and then tell uh, policy, yeah, well, you should um, uh, you should put that into law as well then. Okay, and so um, I talked about that. Um, I uh, gave them uh, in, the, uh, ta in the task after that, various um, versions of um, thought experiment, or not thought experiments, various versions of um, discussion points uh, in order to break up this assumption, we have to buy this decision situation. Um, and it's okay to decide on these ethical things by majority vote. So uh, I gave them different uh, tasks and I'm gonna go through them really quickly so we can still have a discussion about that. So first of all, this was more, and do you understand, um, the um, uh, the uh, kind of reasoning of that ethics commission and um, begin to see that as a provocation, understand how uh, ethical preferences interact with legal settings. Um, and uh, another was um, I uh, tried to talk them by uh, give, giving them texts on corona triage on different ways of seeing this problem because uh, interestingly of course the moral machine authors immediately uh, changed their interface to uh, force you into a decision about uh, which patient uh, should be given precedence and um, it's the same terrible uh, let's say uh, oculus here um, whereas, of course, um, the whole thing of flattening the curve was designed to avoid ever putting these decision situations. And um, still, because countries know that it can come to the West, um, there are actually guidelines in different European countries. And uh, this paper just came a little bit too late for my teaching because it's a very nice thing about um, analyzing guidelines that, of course, especially in, in German case, say you must not differentiate based, based on these traits. 
um, and you have to use other criteria, but still the authors find that there's a lot that really needs to be still worked out um, in the guidelines that we have. And um, so uh, that really uh, provoked quite some thinking, um, this comparison with uh, COVID um, dilemmas. And uh, then another thing was to break up that uh, thought about the illegal pedestrians, um, where one student remarked, I find the use of a criminal icon interesting to represent someone who is jaywalking. Um, and um, then uh, there's a lot of normative stuff here going on, interpreting that uh, apparently in poorer countries, people don't uh, want to sanction jaywalkers quite as much. And that's because they are used to no rule of law. Okay. Um, so uh, I gave them a little text on the history of jaywalking. Jaywalking was actually made into a misdemeanor because, uh, well, because there, there was a historical decision that the road belongs to cars and not to pedestrians. And there are, of course, now these alternative developments, uh, such as European uh, towns that remove traffic signs um, and let all traffic users work out uh, their interactions on the spot in order to make things, the streets safer. Um, and so the purpose of that was to make students understand problem definition as this framing of uh, there is a historical uh, background to why you would present it like that. And it doesn't have to be that way. And you can change the problem by by designing the environment differently. And I think we've had some um, arguments to that effect here, which came as a revelation um, to the student group. And that was very interesting. OK, um, so um, I will not go through this, but um, I invite you to uh, have fun with deconstructing this introduction from the Model Machine paper. Um, sentence by sentence, um, and uh, it's amazing how much normativity goes uh, into that. Uh, so I let them, uh, so we discussed that in class, um, and um, I really wanted to help them understand and uh, get better at recognizing normalized assumptions, and rhetorical strategies, and uh, stuff like that. And OK, I'm going to skip over that. Um, and in a sense, really break up that uh, accepting this problem as it was set out with a forced choice, um, where, which only ever has two options, with no systemic thinking of why do we have this problem um, of, uh, uh, of individual traffic at all, and so on. And so in a sense, I'm, get, I'm trying to get them to these questions, which are uh, laid out uh, in more detail, motivated in that paper I cited earlier. Um, and the teaching challenge, of course, then is to encourage and train this, um, train this kind of mindset. And what I um, then thought was very interesting is asking myself, did this succeed? Um, so after the uh, lectures and the interactive uh, debate and dialogue in those um, follows an equal number of student seminars, um, very importantly, it's, uh, it has to revolve around something that the students themselves propose. Uh, they team up in pairs, they prepare a presentation and co-presentation combo, so they argue uh, against each other. And... Um, each semester we have amazing uh, topics there uh, and interesting presentations. But what's very interesting is after I try to make them question much how problems are being framed in this whole AI ethics debate, what happens extremely often is that they have a very broad view of their topic and make long lists of pros and cons. And I would say that's a bit risk-benefit analysis. Um, they shy away mostly uh, from a very silly analysis and questioning of assumptions. Um, 
and uh, even less so do they go into the details of the language uh, and uh, really attack uh, the assumptions um, of uh, why do we need to have uh, this decision situation and so on. But um, the detailed cataloging of the argumentation style, I still have to do the uh, semester only just finished um, now. So um, a lot of reasons I could think of. Uh, is it easier? Is it what people are more used to? Uh, is it, are they hesitant to challenge the authority of uh, the paper authors? As then some students indicated to me, it could be the format itself. I think that's a very interesting um, uh, uh, observation that I'm at the moment discussing with them. Um, and then there is this thought that I have, which is very much a thought in the making. Um, we came back again and again um, to some discussion of, you know, political correctness in language and the question, is it really important to change language in order to change the world? And there seemed to be a big consensus to uh, that language doesn't matter so much and that we, um, that we shouldn't be attentive to language. And so maybe this general feeling uh, that is born out of the greater situation in which people find themselves in, in these times when there's so much question about how sensitive should we be to language, maybe in this situation they find it even more difficult to take a scientific paper and just, you know, pick it apart word by word and sentence by sentence. Um, interestingly, um, I found that people who are very much on Twitter and follow the flame wars there were found it much easier to get argument deconstruction, maybe because Twitter has these bite-sized uh, uh, units of um, of observation. Um, and it's definitely something I want to um, follow up more. Okay, and so uh, last but not least, um, uh, I want to say um, the proof of the polling will be to see to what extent do people put that in, I mean, engineering students, computer science students, to what extent will they be able to put their ethical thinking honed like that into practice? And this is a very old slide um, that I made in a presentation about a course I was teaching with uh, a colleague, Fanny Coder from, or a part of a course that I was teaching with Fanny Coder from CTIP um, about uh, privacy by design. Um, and we work with two classes and uh, groups of students from these classes and essentially we put them into teams where uh, the, uh, some developed uh, little apps or analysis. Privacy consultants uh, was another group, we gave them feedback via a simulated simplified privacy impact assessment and then these developers were asked to change their designs accordingly. And that worked really well. We've also taken that into, um, into uh, larger teaching contexts uh, with practice, for example. Uh, but we saw also it needs a lot of presentation, a lot of focus um, and very close guidelines about how, it, uh, let's say, feedback should work and what aspects should, people should be looking at. So um, it basically needs another course and um, at some point when uh, I have uh, more people helping me with the teaching this is going to happen and I really really look forward to that um, and um, I also look forward to the next CIF talk um, where again I've highlighted some words from the uh, description on the abstract because I think um, it would uh, be an excellent compliment um, and I uh, usually get lawyers into my classes because they, they really are <laughs> sorely needed and uh, uh, give such an important complimentary uh, view to students. Um, so with that, I want to thank you and open the discussion. And I see there's a lot um, of questions. Uh, how should we do this? Um, uh, Tobias, do you want to read out or should I read? First, Bettina, I want to thank you a lot for this nice introduction. 
I have one question to you that is, what is the question? <laughs> exactly. What is the question? Um, so um, the interesting thing is that's exactly uh, what I asked in this, uh, uh, when I took that more machine experiment uh, to the bigger, uh, to, the, to the more senior um, uh, audiences. And I said, what is the problem? You know, what is the problem we're, we're trying to solve? Um, and apparently it's a mobility problem. So one, one of the participants said, why not public transport? Why don't we talk about that more? Why don't we talk about changing the, uh, the code, uh, the, uh, the rules of the road, why, uh, and so on. And so um, the, I think that is the question. The, the question in this case is mobility. And um, so it comes back to Jenny's first remark about, do we need these autonomous cars at all? Um, and, um, but there are also many other questions. And for example, one student kept talking about, uh, he, he, he always used these glasses of saying, um, there's so much industrial policy in how we approach AI ethics. So he would probably say the problem is that uh, we want to remain competitive by pushing our AI in industry. Maybe that's the problem. But in, definitely, it's not the problem whether the autonomous car should kill the pregnant lady or the dog or the pregnant lady or the, the jaywalker. And, and so that's the, in a sense, that is the question, like question the question. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense, yeah.